So, I hear you're broke, but in need of entertainment. Yes, sir, Mr. Demon, sir. I suppose I may be able to help. I have a few free-to-play games that in mind that uh, might be right up your alley. Wait, really? Already? Of course. And I'm willing to share them with you for a price. Ah, yeah, yeah, I know. You want my soul, I'm willing to do that trade. Eh, well, no, actually. Uh, we don't really need the souls of any gay furry YouTubers. Uh, not much value in those down here. <laughs> no, instead, the price for those free-to-play games is more... Well, you'll see. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I'm desperate for entertainment. I'll pay the price. Whatever it is. Excellent! Well then, let me tell you about... Fortnite. <gasps> no! <laughs> By the way, what's with the hat? Oh, well, like all demons, I work for Chick-fil-A part-time. My shift actually starts after this meeting. Wait, what? I thought Chick-fil-A workers were nice. We are. Are you saying I'm not nice? Well, I mean, you are a demon. Yeah, and I'm giving you free entertainment. Being evil isn't just about being mean, it's about corrupting kindness. Huh. Now shut up and go play Fortnite. I've gotta get to work. Free-to-play games are incredibly common these days, flooding pretty much every virtual games market in existence. You can't take two steps without finding some, often by accident. You. This video was originally just going to be an overview of the history of free-to-play games, but the more I wrote that script talking about how classics like Neopets, RuneScape, and Poptropica inspired the MMOs, Battle Royales, and mobile games plaguing the market today, the more I wondered how. Like, seriously, how do these games still exist? How do they turn a profit? They're free games, and with so many of them for players to choose from, there's no way they can continually be as successful as they are. Right? Well, if there's one thing I've learned from my psychology degree, it's that every stupid little question like that has already been answered and had multiple academic research articles written about it. So today I'm going to be doing a deep dive into the psychology behind how free-to-play games make so much money. And spoiler alert, it's because y'all keep giving them your fucking money. First and foremost, I think it's important to clarify what I mean by free-to-play games, which is games that are free to play. Okay, seriously though, there's a surprising amount of nuance in this definition. In theory, you could count games with free downloadable demos, or software you can download to get a free taste of the game for a certain amount of time, or with most of the game's modes and features being locked. However, I'm not going to count these because while you can play some of the game for free, you would need to pay money to play the vast majority of the game. No, I'm talking specifically about games that offer or promote the entire gameplay experience for free, but have options for you to pay in order to unlock some aspects of the game, such as Fortnite, Fall Guys, Among Us, Multiverses, Team Fortress 2, Genshin Impact, Apex Legends, Super Animorial, Candy Crush, Roblox, <gasps> Pokemon Go, Pokemon Unite, Pokemon Quest, Pokemon Cafe Mix. Okay, now I know this whole free-to-play thing is a scam. No way a company as money-hungry as the Pokemon Company would pump out so many free-to-play games if they weren't turning an absolutely enormous profit. It seems counterintuitive that free-to-play games could make enough money to justify just how many of them exist. They're free, after all, but it's true. They make an absurd amount of money. Fortnite alone generated $5.8 billion in 2021. Billion with a B. That's about $2.3 billion more than Minecraft, the single best-selling pay-to-play game on the planet, has made across its entire time being sold at about $3.5 billion. Fortnite beat that in a single year. Someone explain that to me. Trying to find the answer to how in the world that's even possible online is... Mm, challenging at best. There are a lot of pop science and news articles out there giving away very, very surface-level overviews about the ways free-to-play games are psychologically manipulating players and are forking over loads of money, and I'll admit that this video is kind of going to be one of those. I'm not a primary source doing my own research into this. I'm just a 22-year-old psychology graduate with a YouTube channel. However, I have access to Google Scholar. So, yeah. <laughs> research into free-to-play games and how they work is pretty scarce, mainly because the phenomenon is fairly new and research takes a lot of time and resources. However, there are a few really solid academic perspectives out there either running studies directly focused on free-to-play games or making observations about them that connect really well with previously established academic constructs. Most of the research out there focuses on how business decisions can be made to generate as much money as possible out of free-to-play games, encouraging game creators to stratify their content and make players decide between progressing through the game with money or with absurd amounts of time, to heavily push in-game premium currencies, to utilize special events and limited time offers, and to identify which players are and are not likely to spend money because 
On average, only about 5% of any free-to-play game's players are likely to spend a dime. However, just because these articles weren't intended for us as players, it doesn't mean we can't still learn something about our own behavior from them. A lot of advice given to business executives by academic sources claim to be driven by four different motivations discovered by Dr. Juho Hamari in a 2017 study of gamers. The four reasons that people pay money in free-to-play games. Side note, technically they discovered six, but I'm not going to talk too much about two of them because one of them, indulging the children, makes me really uncomfortable to talk about, and the other, unlocking content, correlates so heavily with all the other motivations that it might as well have just been said that people buy things for the sake of buying things. If you want more details, you're welcome to read the article itself. I have it cited and linked in the description, but I'm just going to be focusing on the main four motivations identified. Okay? Okay. The first factor identified is called unobstructed play, which simply means that something is stopping players from playing the game and makes them mad. Fuck you and take my money! This motivation is primarily utilized by mobile games, where you're forced either to wait a certain amount of time before you're allowed to play the game again, or to pay real-world money to play now. You primarily see this in the way of intrusive advertisements that regularly pop up and make you wait through them for anywhere from 5 to 30 seconds. But this also includes actual in-game timer mechanics like in Candy Crush and King's Quest, where you have a limited amount of lives, regenerating lives takes insanely long, and if you're out of lives, you cannot play. King's Quest is the one that I personally play more often, and I will admit it's rather frustrating to be forced anywhere from 30 minutes to two and a half hours just to play the game again after I lose a level. It often feels like I have the right strategy, and if I could just go again right now, I'll beat it. Just let me play, dammit! I do also want to add that while this includes actual timers, like those in the ads or in the life restoration timers mentioned, it's not exclusive to them. Sometimes the obstruction players want to get past is simply the time it takes to grind. I paid for the Founder's Pass in Multiverses because I didn't want to grind for hours on end just to unlock a character. Instead, I paid $40 and got 15 characters off the bat. That's a solid example of paying money in a free-to-play game to unobstruct gameplay, and it wasn't related to any literal timers. I could have unlocked all those characters on my own, and the time it would have taken me to do so would be different from the time anybody else would have taken to do so. However, one big downside of games using that motivation to encourage payment is that once you clear that obstruction, you kind of lose motivation to keep playing. With King's Quest, if I had infinite hearts and could play whenever I wanted for as long as I wanted, I would get extremely bored and just stop playing. With Multiverses, I loved the game initially, but because I paid for all the characters, it kind of got boring and I stopped playing. Unobstructing play is often a good motivator to make people pay for free games, but it often conflicts with our motivation to actually play the game. Obstacles make games fun, and when you could just step around them with money, what's the point of playing? There isn't any? That's correct. Woo! The second motivation behind in-game purchases and free-to-play games is all about social interaction. This one doesn't conflict with motivations to play the game. In fact, some would argue it actually increases motivation to play the game. The Hamari paper uses social interaction as a blanket factor for all social-based payments, such as things that allow you to play with friends in the first place, or give gifts to your friends. But in today's gaming scene, there's one aspect to social interaction that absolutely dominates social in-game purposes. Completely meaningless customization options. This is where games like Fortnite thrive, giving players countless character skins, weapon skins, and emotes to personalize and customize how they want to express themselves online. Want to be a weird pancake man with angel wings and a gay pride rap shotgun? Pay up and you absolutely can. Purchases motivated by social interaction often have very little impact on the gameplay itself. They're just there for you to show off to your friends. Or enemies. Hey, look, sometimes I, it's, it's fun to stunt on people you demolish in Super Animal Royale. Spending money on cosmetics like this makes you feel connected to whoever you play the game with. It makes you feel like you have a unique relationship with the game and everyone else involved in it. Thus, you're encouraged to keep playing, which is a pretty dangerous combination. Playing the game motivates you to spend money, and spending money for social reasons motivates you to keep playing the game, which creates an endless feedback loop that can be really, really bad for your health and wallet. The third motivation I'm talking about is overall weaker than the others, but it's one I think might be a lot more prevalent in the communities I'm in. It's all about competition, which the Hamari paper highlights as showing off achievements and getting better at the game. While I personally can't think of any free-to-play games where you need to spend money in order to show off achievements, I can absolutely think of free-to-play but pay-to-win games. 
where spending money allows you to get better at the game. In multiverses, buying characters that are stronger or more comfortable for your playstyle absolutely allows players to become more competitive than the competition. In Pokemon Unite, buying items that rapidly level up your Pokemon makes them objectively stronger than those you'd be up against. And in Team Fortress 2, new players can buy weapons that completely change the playstyles of some classes to give them an edge over other new players and push them at least a bit closer to the competitive skill levels of more experienced players. However, the reason I think that this is a much weaker motivation than the others is that a lot of players don't want to be competitive. Unless the game is directly marketed for competition, most players are more than happy just playing the game with what they're given for free. And I personally admire that greatly. In fact, I made a whole separate video about that. You, you should click on that. The last motivation is economic rationale, which focuses less on the game itself and more about just how people spend money in general. This motivation encompasses how people decide to buy things because it's a good deal if they want to support the game developers, or more sketchy than that, there was a limited time offer that they can't pass up. This motivation generally works better when overlapped with the others such as me choosing to buy the Super Animal Royale Season Pass because I want to support the game's developers and because I want to show off the cool cosmetics that unlocks for me. According to the Hamari paper, economic rationale has the strongest association with the amount of money spent, which makes a lot of sense. No matter how cool of a cosmetic something is or how strong of a competitive edge it gives someone, people aren't going to buy it unless they think it's economically viable. Huh. Either way, these four motivations, unobstructed play, social interaction, competition, and economic rationale, all can be, and consistently are, used by free-to-play game companies in order to manipulate us into giving them money over and over again. But, by knowing about these motivations and recognizing the strategies companies use to exploit them, we might be able to overcome it and stop falling for their tricks. The best thing about studying psychology and learning about human behaviors is recognizing when I'm doing those same behaviors and knowing that I have the choice to either continue engaging in those behaviors or not. I see now that the silly Among Us hats and shirts and stuff are something I bought because of the social interaction value they provided to me. I see now that I bought the Multiverses characters because I was sort of baited into feeling like I needed to be competitively competent and get past an unnecessary obstruction of my gameplay. And because I recognize these behaviors in my past, I'm starting to recognize potentials for them to happen again in the future and choose not to spend my money on them. I haven't spent a dime on King's Quest or Fortnite because I simply do not care that much about sidestepping those obstacles or acquiring cool cosmetics for social reasons. I may still choose to spend money on other games, but it's going to be a fully informed choice now, and I think that's a really, really cool power. So, I uh, see that you're really enjoying the games I recommended. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised how much I'm loving them. Alright, listen, when I recommended these games, I said they'd come with a cost. I was expecting you to actually, you know, pay the cost. But it looks like you haven't bought anything. Like, at all. Well, I mean, if that's what's bothering you, you're you're welcome to take whatever money you need out of my wallet. Gee, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for the games. I should have just taken a soul.